I used to serve the Pacific Northwest District as the program specialist, and I now serve the wider Unitarian Universalist Association as a growth strategist. Get this, I am paid to evangelize, grow current congregations, and plant new congregations. Best job on the planet. <laughs> So I've been lurking on the internet sites of fundamental evangelists because, quite frankly, they have systems for planting congregations. <laughs> I mean, they've got systems. They have trainings and boot camps and conferences and coaches just for planting. And I have a hot case of holy envy. <laughs> in a city I was already working in. Well, we were going, as I was going, excuse me, going to the conference didn't work out. But, guess who my seatmates were on a plane ride back to Seattle? That's right. Two fundamental evangelical men who had been to this church planting conference. I strained my ears to hear what they were saying. The older man seemed to be the one in charge. The one closer to my age deferred to him. The older one quoted scripture every other sentence and talked a lot about saving people. Their whole mission is about converting people to Christianity so that they may be saved and get into heaven. And they're very good at planting congregations. So I very slyly got my pen out of my bag and started writing madly all over the Star magazine I was reading. <laughs> I wrote down, concern with personalities determining prophecy, worry that self-imposed isolation of certain planters was a sign of future problems. That's helpful to know, right? <laughs> a rapid saturation of a certain city seemed to be gathered because of charisma and eloquence of a leader. But... If that leader didn't train other disciples to also lead, it was not going to be sustainable. This was really good stuff. <laughs> the cheapest place to hold a conference is Las Vegas, which can be a hard sell to donors. <laughs> there was also gossip about other planners, which shocked me, but I didn't write that down. <laughs> so I'm madly scribbling down everything. I can until I just couldn't help myself. I wanted to jump in, interrupt with all my myriad of questions I had for them. For a split second, a voice in my head warned me, Stop, foreign land. Don't go there. Possibilities for hostility. What are they going to do when they find out you're a Unitarian Universalist? But that didn't stop me. <laughs> congregations? Did you go to the church planting conference? I wanted to go so badly, but I had other work to do. I plant congregations for my denomination. Don't! <laughs> I'd love to hear what you learned. The older man said very flatly, we're non-denominational. The younger man said, which denomination are you? <laughs> Me? I'm a Unitarian Universalist. The younger man looked blankly. The older man grinned like he had something on me. <laughs> My heart fluttered a bit. Jason, you've never heard of Unitarian Universalists? They're the ones with all the ethics and none of the doctrine. <laughs> they do good without believing in hell. Listen to that again. They're the ones with all the ethics and none of the doctrine. They do good without believing in hell. My breathing stopped. That's not where I thought the conversation was going. <laughs> Jason looked at me with fascination as if he just discovered I was a uniform. <laughs> you don't believe in hell? The older man smiled to himself as he put his headphones on over his ears. <laughs> Before I 
I can get a word out, he asked if I believed in Jesus. Jesus the Christ or Jesus the radical, fierce, loving rabbi? I love Jesus the rabbi and consider him one of my greatest teachers. But I don't believe in or have any use for that Christ part. No offense, I'm glad it works for you. I just want everybody to find his or her or their own way that amplifies love and brings out his, her, or their own authentic self. Does that make sense? He was still looking at me like I was even <laughs> And he said, but how do you reconcile John 14, verse 6? <laughs> Some of you know this, don't you? <laughs> Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. I lit up. I know this chapter, and I love this chapter. In my seminary at Seattle University, which is Jesuit, I spent a lot of time meditating on this particular chapter with my Christian cousins in faith, I said, I can reconcile it by the four verses prior to that. In my father's house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would not have told you. Many mansions for so many expressions of the spirit of life and Yahweh and Allah and ultimate source and most awesome goodness and fierce love and holy yes. Can I get an amen? <laughs> so I went on with Jason. So, so let me try to explain Unitarian Universalism in comparison to what I think your understanding and living of Christianity is. And then you can tell me if I'm a little off. Do you believe that we're born sinners? And he nodded. And if you take Jesus Christ as your Savior, then you're saved. And when you die, you go to live in an everlasting life in heaven with him. And he nodded. Like, yeah. Okay, my faith tradition comes out of Judaism and Christianity, so you and I, we share the same roots. Unitarian Universalists believe that we are born from goodness, a fierce love that would blow our minds is so beyond comprehension. And when we die, we go back to that ultimate source of goodness and love, love, love. And that's all out of our control. It's already a done deal. Our current brains and scientific tools can't even comprehend it. It just is whatever it is. So in my faith tradition, we don't spend a lot of time arguing about it. The important part is the in-between, the doing. Our job as children of God is to remember as best we can that mind-blowing, fierce love of goodness and build it here on earth. We work to eradicate all barriers to love and authentic self. We believe that what we do, not so much what we believe, matters. Don't get me wrong, beliefs matter. But only what we believe is important in a way that it helps us do better and love better. So, good, good, do good. <laughs> We stared into each other's eyes for a very long time. I had a melting experience. I broke the silence by asking him about his conversion story. Everybody has a story of some epiphany or an aha or conversion of some sort, a renaming maybe. I have one. These fascinate me. Glimpses of holy yes and the spirit of life. Over the course of about an hour, we had lots of time. Jason told me his tale of parents that weren't enough, his own drug abuse and domestic violence, and giving up, and then someone inviting him to church. The church's very clear doctrine held his despair and gave him direction and hope. His was a moving and beautiful story. We each had tears in our eyes at various times throughout the telling. He asked if Unitarian Universalists believe in conversion. Some. I'm one. I was converted. 
As a bisexual, I felt early on that my sexuality was very tied to God. But that's not what my church of origin was teaching. Quite the opposite. And Unitarian Universalism took all of me, sees me as whole even in my brokenness, as holy even, as, even at my star-reading-based self, and precious even when I feel unlovable. Jason nodded, tears in our eyes again. Mutual understanding of the possibilities and blessings of religious communities. I asked, now secure in our bonding, if his church spoke out against homosexuality. Yes, I went there. <laughs> he paused. I could read an unresolvedness in his slow nod, and I took the leap of faith. Jason, I honestly don't understand that. Remember in Matthew, where the Pharisees asked Jesus, chapter 22, verse 36, Teacher, what, I'm seeing some nods, yeah. <laughs> what is the greatest commandment in all the law? And Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second commandment is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the laws and all the prophets hang on these two commandments. And that right there is what Unitarian Universalists do. We may not profess to believe those words specifically, but that's what we do, and what we do matters. Jason said that I was probably right. It really does come down to that, love. He asked me then, are you a minister? <laughs> and I nodded, and I noticed that he was now staring at my star magazine. <laughs> Yes, an obvious incongruence by most standards. I blushed and explained that I like to keep up on pop culture. <laughs> and that I also pray down the magazine, like I pray down the newspaper, and I pray down the congregations and the leaders in our association. And Jason wanted to pray with me right there, right on the spot. And yes, I led a prayer for Miley Cyrus. I led a prayer for a pop culture character with a tongue that needs an exorcism at 10,000 miles above the earth, holding hands with someone I would usually think hates me and what I stand for, except that day. And as we boarded the plane, I overheard the older man ask Jason if he saved me. <laughs> She was already saved. I tell that story because this is the kind of enthusiastic, open-heartedness that Samaya exudes in the world. Samaya is Samaya boldly and without apology in a way that makes way for each one of us to be ourselves boldly and without apology. There are divisions with Samaya, only love, only goodness. So many communities, even here under one roof, woven together through you, Samaya. Take a moment and look at this beautiful tapestry. Look out among yourselves. Pack that up into your heart. Samaya, you have spent your entire life reaching out in love as a courageous choice and left fierce love amplified in your wake. People inspired to reach beyond ourselves in love. Keep doing that. Keep going there. We will follow. <clears throat> Let's keep walking through this world together, trying to be the best ministers that we can be. Let me 
Beach for the Coach. <laughs>